about this triennial series, which was designed to examine Washington's role in the shaping of the nation's judiciary branch of government. So please, uh, I would say, please join me in a round of grateful applause to the Lehrmans, and they have been so generous to Mount Vernon for many, many years, so we need to capture that. And I'd also like to thank our friends at the Supreme Court Historical Society, with whom we're partnering in this series, and recognize Professor James B. O'Hara, who's the chairman of the Society's Library Committee and a member of its Executive Committee. Professor O'Hara, I was talking to you earlier. There he is. And a Marylander, I might add. And now I'd like to take a moment to recognize the 15 vice regents of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association who are here with us tonight. Ladies, thank you. Stand up and be recognized. We make them come for their continuing education here. <laughs> And our president and CEO, Kurt Vibrance, is here, and his lovely wife, Sissy, and their daughter, too. Oh, you? Yeah. And now for the introduction of our speaker. As you know, we had intended to feature Stanford University Professor Jack Rakoff here tonight, but we learned on Tuesday that he is very ill uh, and can't make, can't make the trip, obviously. So we wish him a speedy recovery. In the meantime, an equally distinguished scholar came to our rescue, and we are very grateful, and you will be too, for that. David O. Stewart practiced constitutional law for more than 25 years in Washington, D.C., before he put his true passion on paper and began writing history. He is particularly interested in, quote, making sense of episodes that are not well understood and also are centrally important to America's development as a nation, unquote. David, among other things, has defended accused criminals, challenged government actions as unconstitutional, and argued many appeals, including two before the United States Supreme Court. Writing has always been a big part of his life, beginning with two years as a reporter for the Staten Island Advance. For almost 10 years, he wrote a monthly column for the American Bar Association Journal. He also has written frequently for the Washington Post, Bloomberg Review, Military History Quarterly, and American Heritage. David is also president of the Washington Independent Review of Books, an online book review that posts new content daily in an effort to fill some of the widening void left as newspapers continue to cut their book reviews. David's books include Impeached, The Trial of President Andrew ja Johnson and the Fight for Lincoln's Legacy, which was a Davis Kid bestseller, American Emperor, Aaron Burr's Challenge to Jefferson's America, which won the Society of the Cincinnati's 2013 History Prize, The Summer of 1787, The Men Who Invented the Constitution, which was a Washington Post bestseller and won the Washington Writing Award as the best book of 2007, and Madison's Gift, Five Partnerships That Built America, which earned the National Society of Colonial Dames William H. Prescott Award for Excellence in Historical Writing. We are fortunate indeed to have David here tonight to inaugurate our Supreme Court Lecture Series, so please join me in giving him a big welcome. Thank you, Barbara, and I'm so delighted to be here at this historic place and to um, be part of your program. Uh, I am slightly self-conscious, of course, because I'm not going to talk about exactly what you thought I might have or the speaker would talk about. Um, I clerked at the Supreme Court and I practiced there, but uh, this is, that's not the subject of this uh, talk. Um, today, I hope to talk uh, principally about James Madison. Um, who was, of course, a close political confidant and ally of George Washington's for a number of years. And I do want to talk about his partnerships, which was the uh, focus of the book I recently did on him. 
I became fascinated with Madison for two basic reasons. The first was that he was so central to the nation's founding. I would make the case that he was the second most important figure. President, President General Washington is the first. He's number one. He cannot be challenged in his day or ever since. Um, but when you look at the list of achievements that Madison had, um, it seems to me that he is unfairly overlooked. Let me just run through a few. He was central to the calling of the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Of course, he was a principal player at that convention, took all the notes f during the convention, uh, and sometimes referred to, I think not entirely accurately, as the father of the Constitution. Afterwards, the fight over ratification was a bitter fight. He was in the forefront uh, in writing the Federalist Papers with Alexander Hamilton, uh, and then in the political battle over ratification. Uh, he led the fight in the state of Virginia, where it was a very tough battle. He was the leading member of the first Congress, often referred to as George Washington's prime minister in that opening year. He wrote the legislation that created the new government. He wrote the Bill of Rights and secured their adoption. He co-founded the first American political party, then called the Republican Party. It's still with us. It's called the Democratic Party now, and it has changed some. Um, but it has had a remarkably long life. In the pivotal election of 1800, he was the co-architect of the peaceful transfer of government between contending parties, from John Adams' Federalists to the Jefferson and Madison's Republicans. It's often said that that's the true test of a democracy or a republic, whether you can have such a successful transfer of government, and he was part of that, the central part of that. He was Secretary of State through the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the nation. He was our first wartime president. In the War of 1812, it was not an altogether glorious experience, but we, he got us through it. And a point I would press is he may well be our only two-term president who had a better second term than his first term. The second term can be very tricky. There are things like Iran-Contra and Monica Lewinsky, just all sorts of pitfalls there. And when Madison left office, the nation really was in an in wonderful condition, great prosperity, and great enthusiasm for him. So we have this long list of achievements, but the second fact that interested me so much in him is that despite this huge long list, he is often ignored. I found myself telling the editor that he's sort of the zealot of the founding era. He's in the picture, but nobody's paying attention to him. And you wonder why that is. Now, there is a flip answer. He was short. Uh, he was skinny. He had a small voice. In rooms filled with noisy people like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, with large charismatic men like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, Madison was easy to miss. I think that's an experience that reverberates through history. The generation that knew him was aware of that, and we are reminded of it. But there's another answer that is, I think, much more interesting. And that's that Madison really was different from most great leaders. Great leaders most often have strong streaks of narcissism. They need to be at the front of the parade, preferably on a white horse with a band playing. <laughs> Madison had none of those qualities of craving recognition or acclaim. He disliked public events, and he never did become comfortable at, at them. There's a wonderful moment at his inaugural ball. It is the first inaugural ball in American history in 1809 when he's just been elected president. And an old friend greeted him and said, isn't this a wonderful night, such an achievement for you, such a recognition of your career? And Madison said, I'd really rather be home in bed. <laughs> uh, he's a man who cared about results, not applause about making the American experiment in self-government a success, about realizing the promise of the revolution. A long-term colleague offered a description that stuck with me as I worked on the book. Under all circumstances, he was ever mindful of what was due from him to others, and cautious not to wound the feelings of anyone. That phrase, ever mindful of what was due from him to others, I think many leaders are extremely mindful of what is due to them from us, a lot less the other way around. 
I found that when I examined Madison's remarkable contributions, it seemed he rarely operated alone. His great achievements were most often the result of partnerships. It was almost as though he had taken one of these modern personality tests that organizations like to have their people go through. They discover, are they an introvert or an extrovert or an ISBJ or an XRZW or whatever that is. And he determined that he was, in fact, short, skinny, had a receding hairline, and zero personal magnetism. Now, such a self-assessment, though, would be incomplete because it also would notice some powerful positives. He was smarter than almost anybody he met. He had a rare capacity for hard work. He had extraordinary political judgment and foresight. And he had a gift, and that's the nature of the title, a gift for making common cause with other people, for checking his ego at the door and concentrating on what needed to be done. Now, we don't know that he made such an assessment, but the idea gave me a lens through which to view his extraordinary career as a man who understood the power of partnership. I'm already behind on my exhibits. Uh, this, of course, is a recent painting of the Constitutional Convention. I just show it as an example of the contrast between Washington, who was president of the convention, and Madison, who's standing next to him, to his right as you look at it. Uh, the only way we know it's Madison is he's holding a quill pen. Thank goodness they gave that to us. Uh, it gives you a sense of how he could, in fact, disappear in a big room. Now, I want to talk about five partnerships, and I will dwell a, a bit longer on the, on the fifth. The first one was with Alexander Hamilton, and this was long before Hamilton learned how to rap. Um, <laughs> they were very different people. Hamilton was a flashy, charismatic personality who's effectively orphaned at 13, comes to this country as a teenager with nothing, nothing but extraordinary talent and drive. He was brilliant at everything he tried, as a soldier, as a statesman, as a lawyer, as a financier. Madison was, as I've described, a quiet man. And he was a fortunate son. He was the inheritor of a great estate. He didn't own his own home until he was in his 40s and got married. Indeed, he lived with his mom until he was 78. Now, I think when they first meet each other in the Congress of the 1780s, this is before the Constitution is adopted, we're functioning under the Articles of Confederation or dysfunctioning, uh, that created such a loose government, a weak government. Um, and Madison and Hamilton were young men who were impatient. They were impatient to realize the promise of the revolution. They were impatient to make the United States a great nation. And even though they were so different, I think they recognized in each other two qualities. The first was they were both wicked smart. And Congress at the time was not the most distinguished body. I make no comparisons to other Congresses. <laughs> the second, though, that they did recognize immediately was that impatience to make the United States a great nation. And it led them to collaborate. Their dissatisfaction with the government under the Articles of Confederation. They jointly led the call for the Constitutional Convention. Critically, of course, they enlisted General Washington's support. Without Washington, not much would happen. But he did come along, and it was Hamilton and uh, Madison who persuaded him. They both had very different conventions. Madison, as I've described quickly, was at the center of things. Uh, Hamilton had a very unfortunate convention. Uh, his delegation, uh, there were three of them. The other two hated him. They disagreed on everything. The other two went home, so he couldn't actually vote on anything thereafter. Uh, he also. Uh, engaged in a certain self-defeating uh, exercise on a day in June. He stood and spoke for five hours. That by itself is probably enough to tick off most of the people in the room. But he told the assembled delegates that he thought the president should serve for life. That sounded a lot like a king. And that uh, 
the Senate should serve for life, which sounded a lot like Dukes and Earls. He left much of the convention, but he came back on the final day and signed it. Washington kept a wonderful diary, and on the final day, he noted that the Constitution had been signed by 10 states and Colonel Hamilton, because <laughs> Hamilton was not then either a member of an official delegation, because his colleagues from New York were still boycotting the convention. But Hamilton said that although no man's ideas of what should be done were more different from this Constitution than his, it was the best we were going to get, and he would support it with all his heart. And he did. The delegates were somewhat surprised after the Constitution was released to find so many people opposed it. There was dissatisfaction with the what looked like it might be a very strong central government. There was concern about the absence of a Bill of Rights. And Hamilton thought an advocacy campaign needed to be undertaken. And that would be through the newspapers, through newspaper essays. He proposed to write 25 essays. By the time he was done, he and Madison, they had written 85 essays, 190,000 words they wrote in six months. For those of us who write for a living, that's a blistering pace, putting aside that it was really good. Um, Hamilton tried to recruit three New Yorkers to help him. The first two, he didn't care for their work, so he just forgot about them. Jay wrote, John Jay wrote five, but he got sick. So Madison was his fourth choice, and it was a brilliant choice. Uh, Madison did join the effort. Uh, he wrote the Federalist essays that I think survive as the most strong, uh, both number 10 and number 51, in many ways defined the American government, and they're still taught in schools every day. And when they put down their pens, having produced the finest political writing by Americans ever, they each had to go back to their state conventions and lead very tough fights for ratification, both in New York and Virginia, which were by no means sure things. Now, the second partnership, thank goodness, was George Washington. Now, Washington was definitely not a peer of Madison's. He, nobody was Washington's peer in this generation. But he also was 19 years older than Madison. He was old enough to be his father. And he was the great hero from the Revolutionary War. And he was in the famous phrase, the indispensable man of the founding. And Madison decided very early that the best way for him to have an influence over this new nation that he hoped would be born was to make himself the indispensable man to the indispensable man. And so he formed a partnership. When Washington wanted legislation through the Virginia Assembly, Madison made it happen. If you wanted legislation through the Maryland Assembly, Madison made that happen. If you needed legislation in Congress, Madison made that happen. And for a period of five or six years, they were extraordinarily close confidants, political allies. Madison came here to Mount Vernon on numerous occasions and stayed with the general. Often in his diary, Washington would indicate that he had canceled everything he planned to do that day and simply would enter in conversation with Mr. Madison. This does, is not something he does with others. Uh, when Washington goes to begin the new government, this is in New York in the spring of 19, 1789, we sometimes lose track of just how little there was that he was about to take charge of. Um, there were about a dozen clerks, uh, 70 or 80 congressmen and senators, and a few hundred soldiers distributed in forts around the country, supposedly defending us against Indians, but mostly getting drunk. And that was it. He was starting from scratch. He was very conscious that everything they would do would set a precedent everything he did. And he knew he had to give some opening speech, what has become traditional, the inaugural address. And he asked a member of his staff, a man close to him, to produce such a speech. He produced one that was 77 pages long. Washington realized that would not work. 
He then asked Madison to write the speech. Madison wrote a four-page speech, which was perfect. It captured Washington's modesty, his humility, and his integrity. It only asked for one thing, very smart sometimes only to ask for one thing, the Bill of Rights. And it was applauded and lauded all through the Congress. But then Congress had a problem. They felt, well, they're setting a precedent. They needed to do something in response. They should produce some written recognition and uh, embarkation on this new venture, this new government. So they needed somebody to write it, so they asked James Madison to write it. And it was sent up to President Washington, and he received this, and he wasn't sure what to do, and he's, of course, a very uh, courteous Virginia gentleman. He thinks he really ought to recognize it in some way, so he asks Madison to write his reply. <laughs> so in many ways, I'd like to say that the first year of the government involved James Madison talking to himself. <laughs> Uh, the third partnership is the one that's most often thought of with Madison, and that's with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, they were, in fact, truly soulmates. They grew up 30 miles apart. Uh, Jefferson was eight years older. Uh, they were both fortunate sons. Their fathers were great landowners, great slave owners. They were both brilliant. They were both interested in everything. They both knew something about most things. Their correspondence is a treat to read. Uh, it covers practical things like the design of plows and hinges. Jefferson was pretty sure that Madison never understood how a hinge worked. Um, it covered literature. It covered philosophy and also politics. Uh, they agreed on most political questions and the point at which they were most thrown together is a key moment in the nation's history, just a couple of years into the Washington administration, when Alexander Hamilton has become Secretary of the Treasury, and he has come in with a very ambitious program uh, to centralize our finances, to create a Bank of the United States, to take over state debts, have the federal government take over state debts, and this alarms Madison and Jefferson. They find this disturbing. And they oppose this with President Washington. And Washington gives serious thought to their objections. And he decides Hamilton is right, and he goes ahead. Frankly, if you wanted, it, there's a, if any of you have seen the Hamilton show, you know this. But there's a wonderful little song there about when Washington and Madison, excuse me, Madison and Jefferson have just lost a few battles and they sing, it would be so nice to have Washington on our side, um, which really was uh, the way to win. But they were on the other side and they set out to do something they would be appalled to know that I was uh, telling you about, which was to build a political party. In this era, political parties according to men of stature, were despicable. They were creatures of uh, people of self-interest, faction to be despised. But they had created a nation where the popular will was sovereign. No person was sovereign. The popular will was. And if you want to influence the popular will, certainly in those days, the best way to do it was a political party. This is pre-Twitter. Um, and it begins with Madison in the House of Representatives gathering congressmen around him who are of a like mind. And from being Washington's prime minister, he emerges as the leader of the opposition. They then reach out to state political figures who also agree with them, and then to editors. And ultimately, by 1800, they do capture the government in the election the presidential election. And their party is the dominant party for the next 60 years, a dominance over our government that really we've never seen in any other period. Now, the fourth character, the fourth partner 
was a figure I didn't know so much about, James Monroe. And I was somewhat disturbed as I first started researching him because a number of his contemporaries wrote reminiscences roughly of the order of, well, he's a nice enough fellow, but he's a little dim. <laughs> and I kept reading, and I concluded that that was not fair. He was what my father would have called smart enough for all practical purposes. <laughs> he was not a guy you would have asked to write the Federalist Papers. No argument there. Indeed, he opposed the Constitution, and he wrote a long essay opposing the Constitution, and then he got up the next day and reread it and decided not to get it printed, because he didn't think it was that good. He was much more a military type. He had been a young officer in the Revolution, had been wounded at the Battle of Trenton. He always fought in military terms. He was another big strapping Virginian. Um, and he and Madison were friends in a way that perhaps Madison and Jefferson were not. Uh, there's a little bit of a sense when you look at the Madison and Jefferson correspondence that they're sort of working pretty hard to be interesting. And with Monroe and Madison, they're just writing to each other and they're swapping a lot of political information and views. In fact, Monroe was pretty shrewd politically, sometimes shrewder than Madison. <coughs> he warned Madison not to trust Aaron Burr. Madison had known Burr in college, did trust him, and turned out not to have been trust not well placed. Um, the interesting thing about their partnership is that they were direct rivals twice. They are the only future presidents who ran against each other for lower office. In the first congressional election in 1789, they opposed each other in a Virginia congressional district. Now this came about because Madison was the most prominent ex proponent of the Constitution and Patrick Henry desperately wanted revenge against Madison for the ratification that he won in Virginia and he persuaded a handsome uh, war hero to run against him. And they really ran against each other. This is an era when del candidates preferred to stand for office, not to run for office, and Madison hated running for office. But against Monroe, he had to. And they went to different uh, churches on Sunday and would, after services, they would stand outside in January, a very cold January, and essentially debate each other. Coming home in the evening from one of those on a bitter night, Madison suffered frostbite on his nose, which left a scar that he always referred to as a wound suffered in defense of his country. <laughs> it was the closest he ever got to a battlefield. Actually, that's not true. I'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, he ultimately won the election fairly handily, and both men afterwards said, there's no ill feeling about having opposed each other. We opposed each other on principle, and we are still best of friends. And amazingly enough to me, they seem to be. They really did pick up their friendship without any hitch. But 20 years later, it was not the same. Uh, Monroe was a diplomat in London. This is the era of the Napoleonic Wars. The French and the British are trying to kill each other. And we are the collateral consequences. Our trade, our merchants are trying to do business with both sides. Both sides hate us for it, although they want our goods. Uh, and so they seize our, many of our goods. Uh, the British were uh, always seizing our sailors, the impressment issue. And Jefferson did not want to go to war. You could not provoke that man into war. God knows the British tried. So he told Monroe to negotiate a treaty with Britain. Britain could have cared less about the United States. We had no navy, we had no army. They were fighting Napoleon. And so they signed a treaty that essentially gave us nothing. Monroe sent it back to Washington. Madison and Jefferson took one look at it, stuck it in a bottom drawer, and it was never spoken of in public again. Monroe, who was a very, had a very sensitive ego, was very much hurt. Uh, he chose to blame Madison for this, not Jefferson. It's always smart not to blame or get on the outs with the president. Uh, 
But when he returned to the country in 1808, he allowed his name to be put into nomination against Madison. Madison was expected to succeed Jefferson, but Monroe stood as a candidate against him. He only got, I think, three electoral votes, but his rancor was real. And for two years, these great friends of 30 years standing did not speak to each other, did not correspond with each other, until the moment when Madison realizes or decides that he's going to have to go to war. And he has a very unfortunate Secretary of State, a fellow named Robert Smith from Maryland, who was both not particularly competent and also disloyal. It's not a good combination. And Madison fires him. And you had to do a lot to get fired by James Madison. And he needed a strong Secretary of State, an ally, and somebody who could rally the country. So he did reach out to Monroe. And Monroe, who had been starting to get restless in exile, effectively, played a, required a certain amount of back and forth, but ultimately joined the Madison administration as Secretary of State. He also served as Secretary of War. And for two periods, he served simultaneously as Secretary of State and Secretary of War. I think he's the only person in our history ever to do that. And he was a real, very important mainstay of the Madison administration. Now the fifth partnership, oh, I have bollocks this up. There we are, um, is his wife Dolly of 42 years. She was the star. She brought the charisma, the warmth, and the unfailing charm. This is obviously in her mature years, but the one thing I want to emphasize about this and the other images I will show you is that this is an era of very sober portraiture. Madison generally in his portraits looked like somebody just shot his dog. <laughs> the, the painters could not get the smile off of Dolly's face. Every image you will see there is a little smile. Now she was originally Dolly Payne. Like James Madison, she grew up on southern plantations, but with a significant difference. This is the first image we have of Dolly, and many of you will notice she's wearing a Quaker bonnet. She was raised Quaker, and when she was a young teenager, the Quaker meeting in Virginia decreed that no Quaker in good standing could own slaves. So Mr. Payne released, emancipated his slaves and moved his family to Philadelphia. He opened a business there. It swiftly went broke. To keep body and soul together, Mrs. Payne ended up converting their house to a boarding house for con congressional visitors. But Dolly prospered in Philadelphia. She loved the city. Uh, the city loved her. She was tall for the time. She had an hourglass figure, a mischievous smile, which you can see. Uh, black hair, a creamy complexion, sharp blue eyes. Pe men liked her. Men liked her a lot. And I always like to point out that say what you will about Madison's small stature, his receding hairline, his personal reserve and large settings. Of all the founders, and with respect to General Washington, he had the hottest wife. <laughs> now, Dolly had a first husband, a Quaker lawyer in Philadelphia, and had two sons with him. The husband, John Todd, and one of their sons died in the yellow fever epidemic of 1793, leaving Dolly as a very eligible single mother. She did not want for suitors, but one of the most ardent was Madison, who was 17 years her senior. This is the one portrait we have of Madison that shows a little zip. I do like this one. Um, we don't know all the particulars, but we know there was something like Madison saw her on the street or at a, at a social event and said the equivalent of, who is that woman? And he was told, and he did his homework, and he figured out that his old college friend, Aaron Burr, was a lodger in Mrs. Payne's boarding house. So he prevailed upon Senator Burr to introduce him 
to this charming woman. And the note that Dolly writes on the day that the two gentlemen are coming over is a wonderful note, and it indicates both Dolly's wit and her perception when she writes that Senator Burr is bringing over the great little Madison. <laughs> he was little, sure, but he was also great. He was a political power, he was rich, he was intelligent, he was kind. You could do a lot worse than James Madison, and Dolly figured that out right from the start. Now, I enjoyed studying their relationship, not what I have done much of. Um, it was a chance to see a different side of James Madison. Uh, the two were rarely apart, so we don't have many letters between each of the two of them, but the ones we have are wonderfully warm and loving, long after the rush of first infatuation. There are also accounts of a flirtatiousness that one doesn't generally associate with Madison. When they first moved to the White House in 1809, Dolly's younger sister Lucy moved in with them. She had just been widowed, she had three children, and she lived there for three years with them. By all accounts, Madison enjoyed Lucy a great deal. She was just as vivacious as Dolly. <coughs> and one of the things he liked to do was kiss Dolly in the presence of Lucy and turn to her and say, does that make your mouth water? <laughs> now, I will admit that it's a little creepy. <laughs> but I'm hoping to show you a different side of James Madison <laughs> and that you won't think of him the same way. Now, the Madisons never had children of their own, and they are sometimes portrayed as this semi-sad, childless couple, which is extraordinarily wrong. They always had children running through the house. Between them, they had more than 50 nieces and nephews, some of whom were visiting most of the time. Uh, they came for weeks or months, uh, as well as the daughters of friends, mostly daughters. Dolly could be relied upon to introduce a teenaged woman to an appropriate naval officer or army officer. Um, they uh, were a lot of fun which is often missed in small groups. James was quick with a quip, loved to tell humorous anecdotes. Many have wrote, remembered him keeping the table in stitches. Dolly was always vivacious and engaging, a photo dullness as one of her nieces called her. And they did things that you may not associate with them. This, of course, is Montpelier. You can see the front portico there. It's not a giant space. But in retirement, they used to run races against each other there. There were either very short races or they involved a lot of turning. <laughs> um, and uh, with the years, Dolly grew wider. Uh, James never did. And so their play also involved, on occasion, Dolly loading him up on her back and carrying him through the house. It was, however, fun with a purpose. Through Madison's eight years as Secretary of State and eight as President, Dolly set a bright social tone. I do admire this image of her during this era. It was a Republican tone, a stylish one, an informal one. Dolly took snuff. Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House, would bring her, his special snuff, excuse me, from Kentucky. Uh, she played cards, but she tried to scale that back when they were in the White House. And by all accounts, she was not a good card player, which is always charming. Um, <laughs> and she understood the need to provide glamour and charisma. James just couldn't do it. As the wife of the president, she began wearing these turbans, white turbans, either satin or velvet. And she would put a flower in the top of the turban or a piece of fruit even. And their parties, and they had two a week when Congress was in session, uh, it consisted of James arriving and greeting every guest very cordially, very, for a very short time, welcoming, welcoming them there, and then retiring to a corner with a couple of gentlemen to talk business. Dolly would sweep in, in her turban, and hold court in the middle of the room. 
Uh, she always sought out the most awkward person in the room and tried to put them at their ease. On one occasion, she was carrying a copy of Cervantes's Don Quixote. And somebody said, why do you have that here at a party? And she said, well, if the conversation lags, then there's something I can bring up. <laughs> she thought about these things. There was a famous exchange she had with Henry Clay, who was a special favorite of hers, one of these sort of state, public conversations, when he said, everyone loves Mrs. Madison, and she, of course, without missing a beat, said, that's because Mrs. Madison loves everybody. It wasn't strictly speaking true. She actually held a grudge better than James did. But it seemed to be true, and in politics, that's far more important. Indeed, as the presidency went on, Dolly, who was referred to as the Lady Presidentess, we did not yet have the term First Lady, uh, was the person many people went to with their request for an office or an appointment. They would present their petitions to Dolly. Now, there is no record of how she presented them to James. They were far too discreet for that. But people don't keep doing that if it doesn't work a few times. And indeed, Dolly was, in truth, a political partner, a loyal and sure-footed one, who not only warmed his private life, but helped him forge a style for the nation. The Federalist candidate for president in 1808, somewhat ungallantly, claimed that he had lost to Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have had a better chance had I faced Mr. Madison alone. Now, Dolly's shining moment came on the worst moment of Madison's presidency, which is the day of the burning of the public buildings in Washington by the British troops. This followed the Battle of Bladensburg, which was such a brief affair that it's sometimes referred to as the Bladensburg races because our militia was in such a hurry to leave. Um, Madison did actually go to the battlefield. I wanted to button that up. Um, and his contributions there consisted of almost riding into the British lines by mistake, not understanding where they were. Uh, captain managed to save him at the last minute. And then when he went to give the final instructions to the general in charge, General Winder, he was unable to control his horse, a borrowed mount. And they ended up not having a conversation. As I have said, he was not a military figure. Um, when the word came to the White House that the British were marching into Washington, Dolly already had packed up the silver and the state papers, sent them off. And as she was preparing to leave, there is the famous incident where she noticed the Gilbert Stewart portrait of General Washington. And we sometimes forget the context for this. The nation is less than 30 years old at this point. We have essentially almost no history. We have no king, we have no royalty, we have no aristocracy. What we have is George Washington. And Washington and this portrait are really the touchstone of the nation. Indeed, prints of the Stuart portrait hung on many American homes, the walls of many American homes in this era. It was widely known. And she realized that if this fell into British hands, it would have a tremendously demoralizing effect on a nation that clearly, clearly, clearly was going to be demoralized anyway. So she directed that it be taken down. They couldn't take it down. They had to break the frame and cut it out, roll it up, and were able to save it from the British. And at a time when many Americans denounced the president for having presided over this unfortunate uh, burning of the nation's public buildings, for having run from the British, they took heart in the spirit and presence of mind of Dolly Madison, and were proud of how she had behaved in the crisis. Now, I do want to talk for a minute about a subject I've managed not to talk about so far, which is Madison and slavery. I don't think it's fair <clears throat> to skip it. Uh, he lived his whole life in a slave culture. It's often overlooked, much to my shock, that his father was, grand, was poisoned, excuse me, his grandfather 
was poisoned by his own slave and died. The slave was hanged. Madison never commented on that story, never wrote about it. Nobody ever recalls, recalled him speaking of it. But you know that the 100 slaves at Montpelier, every one of them knew that story. And that the Madisons there, we may assume they were mostly small people, also all knew that story. And it somewhat captures the viciousness, the violence, the oppression involved in the slave relationship. Now, as a young man, Madison struggled with the contradictions between slavery and his commitment to liberty. He wrote about it frequently. At the Constitutional Convention, he was appalled that everybody was arguing about would the large states or the small states have more power. And he said on several occasions, don't you people understand, it's not that that's going to divide this country, it's slavery. That's what's going to divide this country. Indeed, as a young man, he bought land in upstate New York in the Mohawk Valley. And he wrote to a friend that he hoped to move there and never live on the labor of others. Now, he never did it. You can make up a bunch of reasons why. He was very comfortable having slaves. Life was labor intensive in that era. Getting your clothes clean and cooking a meal was a big deal. Also, being a Virginia plantation owner was a terrific political platform. There he was 30 miles from Thomas Jefferson. He's got Washington over here in Mount Vernon. He's got access to the great leaders. And he's a citizen of the biggest state in the Union. Those political advantages would not have followed him to the Mohawk Valley. Now, through his busiest public career as Secretary of State and President, there's little evidence that he was thinking much about slavery. But when he goes into retirement in Montpelier, it haunts him again. I think some of this is that he's there with his 90 slaves all day. He always had slaves in the White House. He always had people who did his work. But it wasn't everybody around him. He also had lived to a period when we had the beginnings, just the very beginnings of abolitionist feeling. People would come and uh, strangers would come stay with him, or at least come by for a meal. This, of course, happened to the Washingtons all the time. It's a way we managed to torture our ex-presidents. Um, and some of them were Northerners and Europeans who were actually quite comfortable explaining to Madison that it was scandalous that he owned slaves. He did not take to this very well. He responded in a couple of ways. One is this pretty sad measure, which they're trying to rebuild now at Montpelier. He decided to build nice slave cabins. Actually, they had glass windows and hinged doors. They were nicer than the homes of many free whites in the period. It was only for the house slaves, not for the field slaves. And of course, uh, they were still slaves. The other thing he did was he kept writing memos to himself. This is something he did through his life to try to figure a way out. He had led the nation to figure out how to get a stronger government. In the Constitution, he had led the nation somewhat unsteadily through the War of 1812 to establish that we are a serious nation on the international stage. This is a third great challenge. And he's tortured by it. He proposes, as Jefferson did, that we could sell off all the Western lands, take the money, buy all the slaves out of bondage, and ship them off somewhere. South America, Africa, out west. He didn't really, he wasn't fussy about where, just somewhere else. He, did, he thought race prejudice was too deep in Americans to have an integrated society. It was a pipe dream. It couldn't be done. And I think it was one of the great regrets of his life. Now, James lived to be 85, which was a surprise to him. He always had bad health. 
And this is an image of him just two years before his death in 1836. Dolly survived him by 13 years, which created some poignancy in her late life. She was left with Montpelier. It's a tough time to run a plantation in, America, in the South, certainly in Virginia. She was not a woman of business. She had wonderful qualities, but that was not one of them. And she lost the plantation, had to sell it, and she spent the, her final years in a sort of genteel poverty in Washington in another house that they had owned. But, oh, if I can get this. There's a great picture of her. Have I done something here? Help me out if you can. Excuse me. Hit the reset button. Thank you. We have a photograph of Dolly. This was taken in the last year of her life. By many accounts, this was the one good dress she had left. And I think you can see there's still the trace of that smile and also a woman of substance. Now, I have talked here a good bit about Madison's partnerships. And I want to close by emphasizing that he was able to form these partnerships because of who he was. We, he is often portrayed as this disembodied intellect, this mind. But I think his greatest qualities were his genuineness, his integrity, his modesty, and his open-heartedness. That's what all these very different people appreciated about him. That's what allowed him to work with so many different people. And for me, these qualities shine through in the way he received the news of the end of the War of 1812, the agreement incorporated in the Treaty of Ghent. It's February 13, 1815. Madison is living at Octagon House. The White House is burned. Octagon House still stands on 17th Street. And a rumor arrives that a treaty has been signed with Britain. A Pennsylvania senator rushed to Octagon House to ask Madison if it was true. Let me just read a couple of sentences from the, the book. The senator found the house dark, the president sitting solitary in his parlor, in perfect tranquility, not even a servant in waiting. The senator asked if the rumor was true. Madison bade him sit down. I will tell you all I know, he said, then confirmed that he thought there was peace, but he had no official confirmation. The senator recalled with some wonder what he called the president's self-command on the occasion and greatness of mind. The War of 1812 had truly been Mr. Madison's war, as his opponents called it. It was about principles, not gain. It was fought with a quiet tenacity, sometimes ineptly, and with endless tolerance of those who opposed it. A friend of Madison's wrote years later that the war had been con conducted in perfect keeping with the character of the president. And when peace came, Madison welcomed it in a darkened house, sitting alone with his thoughts. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions, and uh, please wait for the microphone because we're recording this and airing it out into the internet. So, please, who's first? There you go. Could you comment on the influence of George Mason? Uh, on what? <laughs> <laughs> on Mr. Madison's thinking. I, Bill of Rights. Sure. Madison and Mason had a long relationship, and it had several seasons. Uh, Madison's first public service was at the Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1775. Mason was in many ways the dominant figure at that convention. Madison is a man of 25 at the time, and he sort of latches on to Mason a bit and works with him on the clause for freedom of religion, 
Uh, this was, through his life, a particular hobby horse of Madison's, or I shouldn't, don't mean to demean it in any way, an issue he cared deeply about. Uh, and he insisted that the language be changed from simply tolerating religions to in encouraging the practice of religion. His view was, we don't tolerate religion. We recognize it and we celebrate it. Uh, they were not close then. They were many years apart in age. But they had served in the Virginia Assembly some together. Uh, they were supposed to be uh, part of the process that led to the Constitutional Convention. And then Mason did serve in the Constitutional Convention. And that was a difficult experience for their relationship. The first couple of months there, they seemed to work well together. In the last six to eight weeks, Mason sort of fell off the bus on the Constitution. He didn't like the way it was going. Madison was somewhat frustrated by Mason's skepticism and what be ripened into opposition. And they ended up on fairly poor terms, as did Washington. Uh, Mason refused to sign the Constitution. And indeed, uh, when the Virginia Ratifying Convention has its great debates, the two leading voices against the Constitution are Patrick Henry and George Mason, and Madison is the leader of the pro-Constitution forces. Uh, thereafter, they don't have much to do with each other, although Jefferson always valued Mason. Jefferson actually was not that much of a friend of the Constitution. He had a lot of doubts about it. He had been in Paris when it was written. And so he does broker a sort of rapprochement. Madison does visit Mason in 1791, right before his death. It's rather actually a, one of those poignant moments where Jefferson and Madison drop by uh, Mount Vernon, but just for a few minutes, because they're actually not with the general anymore. And they go and have, have a meal with Mason, who has now become their friend, uh, again. So they, they moved around. Did, uh, in his later, li later life, did he admit the necessity of the Bill of Rights? Did he ever change his mind over not having uh, promoted it at first? Well, he sponsored the Bill of Rights. Uh, I skipped over this, but at the Constitutional Convention in the last week, Mason and Elbridge Gerry had proposed a Bill of Rights, and Madison and most of the other delegates shouted them down, basically saying, we don't need one. The federal government can never challenge your rights. Um, and uh, I think they saw it as a stalling tactic, which to some extent it was. Um, and they discovered, and Madison discovered pretty quickly after the Constitution was promulgated that that had been a big mistake, that it created real political liability. And when he ran against Monroe for Congress, he said, I will support a Bill of Rights. I will make it happen. Now, many of the amendments people wanted to the Constitution, or the opponents wanted, uh, would have stripped the federal government of the power to levy a tax, uh, would have dramatically changed the structure of the government. Madison always said, I don't want to do that. But I do think we should have rights incorporated. His remarks when he introduced the Bill of Rights are wonderful. They're so Madisonian. He describes the Bill of Rights as not altogether useless. Uh, he definitely thought that in times of crisis, a Bill of Rights doesn't matter. The government will do what the government wants to do and will violate your rights. And I think we have seen that's true. But he also said, this is a way that we can educate ourselves and the society to understand that those rights should be there. And over time, they will become part of our political culture. That's my phrase, not his. Um, and I think that was true. You know, of course, the Supreme Court never enforced any of the elements of the Bill of Rights until the 20th century. It took a long time. But they have proved, I think, to be not altogether useless. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'd like to get your uh, thoughts. I have this impression that once Madison was president, his partnership with Jefferson was in part tested by um, Madison's, the reality of having uh, John Marshall. So many of the Supreme Court cases that made federalism um, were Marshall's cases during Madison's terms. And I'm, I know Jefferson would fire off these really angry letters to Madison, which he would kind of ignore or he would acquiesce in. Um, Madison uh, did have the gift of ignoring Jefferson when he ran off the rails, um, which he needed to do. Um, but they both were unhappy with John Marshall as Chief Justice. Uh, I think Madison sort of characteristically was less outraged, just a question of his temperament, probably. And I was struck, actually, when Jefferson was the ex-president and Madison was his successor, at the amount of respect that Jefferson accorded him, an understanding of the difficulty of his position. I don't think anybody understands how hard it is to be president ex except the, someone who has been. And Madison was the same way when Monroe succeeded him. Both times the new president would ask the opinions of the ex-president. And the ex-president, carefully, not in an aggressive way, would give those opinions. And a lot of times, the new president would ignore them. Madison recommended against the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, Jefferson didn't like the Bank of the United States ever. Madison came around and decided it was an OK idea. So they respected each other politically. They remained close personally. So uh, I, I think it, it had to do with that shared experience. In uh, your research, have you found any relationship of particular note between uh, Madison and uh, Oliver Ellsworth at the Constitutional Convention or the appointment of Oliver Ellsworth as the third Chief Justice of the United States? No. <laughs> Uh, he was appointed Chief Justice uh, during the Adams administration when Madison was not in Congress, so he, he was in retirement, a uh, brief retirement in Montpelier. Uh, at the Constitutional Convention, there isn't much evidence of their working together closely. Ellsworth was an important delegate. They must have had a lot to do with each other. But, you know, so much of history is silence. And in this instance, we just don't have much record of their interactions. This, this is more an observation than a question. Uh, you've noted the magnificent contributions of Madison over the years. There's one thing I would add to it. Madison appointed two Supreme Court justices one was a man by the name of Gabriel Duval from Maryland. He served for 25 years and no one heard of him after his appointment until the present day. However, the second justice he appointed was Joseph Story, who is certainly one of the greatest justices in American history, certainly one of the greatest justices of the 19th century, maybe the, the greatest after John Marshall. If you have any comment on those two appointments, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I, I don't actually, but I, I would like to add, since we do have the Supreme Court Historical Society here, that Lucy Washington, uh, she was Lucy Washington, she had married, uh, Dolly's sister Lucy had married George Washington's nephew. He dies, leaves her a widow, and she moves into the White House with the Madisons for three years, and then she marries a Supreme Court Justice, Thomas Todd, who was a Jefferson appointee and who was christened in a recent scholarly exchange as the least significant justice in American history. <laughs> he was a wealthy man, though. Lucy knew what she was doing. Perhaps um, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no way to know this, but um, do you have any thoughts on how reliable Madison's notes on the convention are? Um, 
were they in any way infused with his own aspirations, thoughts, and desires? Uh, the question, it's a great question. There, you know there's a new book out on this subject, Madison's Hand by Mary Sarah Builder. I was on a program with her a few weeks back, and I have gone through the book. Um, we've always known that for years later, Madison monkeyed with his notes. We really wish he hadn't. You know, every time you come upon it, you just want to say, put the pen down. Um, you can tell where he did. You know, this is not a case where you can use the delete function in the computer. He had to scratch it out with a pen and, you know, put a carrot in and show where the insertion was. Um, I did a book on the Constitutional Convention, which of course relied heavily on his notes. I think they are very reliable, not 100%. I think you have to take with a grain of salt his speeches. I suspect they were not quite as good on the floor as they are in his notes. Um, we know that a few of the speeches actually were given to him verbatim. Ben Franklin, for example, was old and wise enough to know that he'd, if he wanted his words recorded, he'd better write them out himself. So he gave, him his, gave Madison his speeches, and Madison got those verbatim. Uh, and we do have scraps of notes from other delegates. There was a New York delegate uh, who took notes uh, for the first six weeks. And when Madison says somebody's talking about something on this day, the other people's notes show the same thing happening, so that show the same general uh, discussion. Madison seemed to wash out the colorful terms of phrase. He discovered the, the juicy stuff is in other people's notes. He's making everything a bit more vanilla, making it seem like it would be, it was more of a consensus experience, which of course it wasn't at all. Um, and I do think, uh, by and large, it, it is largely reliable. There is a problem with the last six weeks or so of the convention. Uh, he, his notes get very short. Those have always been sort of explained as, well, he was busy, he was on committees, he was tired. Um, there is a suggestion now in this new book that he actually wrote those a couple of years later. I don't know that the evidence drives me to that conclusion, but it, it's something to be, to, to, to notice. Maybe the last two questions here. Yeah, last two. Can you speak of Madison's role? Did he help Jackson when Jackson was president in uh, refuting the nullification exposition? I. Uh, Madison was appalled by nullification. He wrote against it and was published writing against it and was denounced. And he took that very ill. He wrote to his editor that he was tired of have, having people read his stuff and say, I wonder how old he is. <laughs> Ageism is not a new thing. Uh, he was a supporter of Jackson's general approach. I don't know that, and obviously grateful to him for winning the Battle of New Orleans, uh, I don't know that he was a sort of, at a personal level, somebody who was a natural fit with Jackson. Uh, in the 1828 election, the candidates, uh, both Clay and Jackson, come to uh, Montpelier and uh, pay homage to him. He, meets them both. He doesn't endorse anyone. Uh, so that particular moment, they are absolutely on the same side. I think temperamentally, they were pretty different. Let's have one more in the back there. Yes, as a descendant of Alexander Hamilton, I was wondering, um, did Madison and Hamilton's relationship, I realize Hamilton died young, but did they ever patch things up? Um, just curious. One of the features of Madison is he never really ends up in a hate relationship. 
Uh, Hamilton writes this incredibly poignant letter in 1795 or so to a Virginia guy, I think hoping that it would be shown to Madison, basically saying he just doesn't understand why Madison is against everything he's saying for. He thought Madison would support this stuff. Um, and in 1796, President Washington has a vacancy. for He needs a new ambassador to France. And Hamilton says, you should appoint Madison. So they're not enemies. They are political adversaries. But I think there was a residue of good feeling. Madison and Washington, although Madison ended up a political opponent, the relationship does not sour the way Washington's relationship with Jefferson did, which really became quite rancorous. Um, with Madison, uh, again, Washington approached Madison and offered him the ambassadorship in 1796. Madison's been in opposition for five years. Madison declines it. We don't exactly know why. He doesn't give a reason. It's thought the reason he did was, um, aside from many others, he never was willing to go out on the ocean. He had some form of epileptic disorder that gave him fits and one of the medical truisms of the time, and there were many that were false, this may be one of them, was that if you were on the ocean, it would the rhythm of the waves or whatever would induce fits like that. So he always avoided it. But I don't think you see the sort of enmity in any of Madison's relationships that you do get with other founders. Thank you. Thank you. I want to particularly thank uh, David Stewart for uh, coming in at the last minute. What a fantastic job he did tonight, wasn't that? Amazing? I want to thank all of you. I want to thank the uh, Supreme Court Historical Society and their leadership for helping put, put this together. We have a few more books for sale uh, of David Stewart's books right outside here. And also, I'd like to welcome you all to have a drink at the, at the far end of the hall in the book out reception area and uh, enjoy and explore the library a little bit. Uh, what's that? The buses will be here. Yes, sir. They're straight that way. So thank you all. And uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I wish I had a Washington. Yeah. That was great. That was great. We, we got to hear the context to get to know Washington. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry I wasn't Washington. Yeah. It's perfect for us. We know, we know everything. Oh, I, I got hold of it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.